Uh, great to have you here. But uh, again, I'm Jim Hankson, the president of the College of Central Florida. We are extremely excited and proud to have with us this evening Bernadette Castro, chair of Castro Properties. Bernadette and her family are longtime friends of Marion County. They've invested in the community through various business and philanthropic ventures for many, many years. And tonight, Bernadette will share a little bit about her family and her story, and she'll share how her dream, dreams have changed over time. One thing I do want to mention about Bernadette, when you look at today, uh, who watches The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon? All of you have ever seen those? Any, anybody? All right, y'all just eating, that's what it is. It's okay, you eating. Anyhow, think about America's Got Talent. Anybody watch America's Got Talent? Yeah, at least they're not in your heads, that's good. Uh, anyhow, with that, you have uh, somebody wins America's Got Talent, runner up, they're, on, they're doing the circuit of all the TV shows, like The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, Conan O'Brien, all those. Well, you have someone here tonight who uh, was the national phenomena of TV, the t best TV actress in America, across the whole country, uh, at four years old. And she was on the original Tonight Show with the Johnny Carson. Uh, I don't know, you guys probably don't know Milton Berle, but one of the best comedians of all time. A great commercial with Milton Berle. Uh, and it's been fantastic. Also with Jackie Gleason. Uh, but it's just, uh, when you talk about television personalities way back then, that was just a little inkling at a young age. But she's done so much more, and, and she's going to be talking about that. She's also the queen of UBC, I find out. So thrilled about that. But thank you for being here tonight. Uh, but uh, please uh, enjoy the story. I think we got a great, great opportunity. But she's so involved with businesses and different events and charities with her philanthropy. And she's got a great story to tell. So let's give a big, warm CF welcome to Ms. Bernadette Castro. Her <laughs> Video. Let me just say something about the video. I did not produce that. It's borderline embarrassing. I do a couple of auctions in New York for not-for-profits, and one of the organizations decided to produce this little intro um, to hope that I could raise more money as the auctioneer. But um, it does show how many times my dream has changed. And that's, that's the point of tonight and, and talking to the students. And I'm happy to see some friends here, but I'm really happy to see students here. So it's, it's a great honor for me to be here with you. Um, I think I'm a frustrated professor, so this is like right up my alley. I want to thank President Henningsen so much for the invitation. And Chris Knife um, has been great. And it's a wonderful institution. And you're very fortunate to be here and to have it so close right here in the heart of our community. So before we go into about my dreams, you need to know backstory, right? Backstories are important. And they usually involve one's parents. And that's really why I am here today. My parents' portrait is on display, exhibited on the business floor. Um, it's quite a backstory. My father was an Italian immigrant, came to this country at 15, 
with his father, had no money, couldn't speak English, had a lot of money in Italy on his mother's side. His father was a gambler, gambled it all away. He came here because he thought there'd be gold in the streets. And there were no, no gold in the streets. He quickly learned he had to learn English at night school, and he had to find a way to make a living. A dilemma that many people find today, Americans and new immigrants. He decided that he would become, in those days, you're talking about late 1920s, if you were in a bank for immigrants, you were also kind of a travel agent, you were multitasking. And so he loved that idea. He could put on a coat and tie and go to work and make money. Except he realized that some of the men coming in weren't dressed very well, hands were rather rugged, and making a lot more money than he was. So he said, this coat and tie thing isn't working for me. He went out and he started working in various crafts until finally he landed working for someone in the furniture industry. So the furniture industry, you have to understand, fabric is like the most expensive raw material, right? So you can't waste fabric. So he became a cutter. Cutters were valuable because they were precise on the fabric. In fact, he became the best cutter, period. So Mr. Cohen, who gave him his first break, also had an empty loft, a walk-up. And my father said, could I please rent the empty loft from you? Mr. Cohen said, great, you can cut for me at night and you can work in day at your own business. So my father said, deal. And the little upholstery shop on that second floor grew into an interior design shop. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have allergies today, so let me just take a quick drink of water. So my dad was totally into it. He could make the draperies, he could install them, he was upholstering furniture, he loved it. He'd go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, he'd study classical furniture, it was great. But he wasn't making enough. And a couple of women came in with these very ugly sofas called Davenport's. They did open up, but it took two people to open them up. They really looked horrible. And they said to my father, we really want you to make these look better. He said, I can do that, I just take the bed out. He went, can't take the bed out. They said, we need the bed. And my father was thinking, okay, we're in America. There seems to be a demand and nobody's meeting it. They want a bed in a sofa that they can open and that looks pretty. And he started playing with various mechanisms and he came up with what you all know today. Sleeper sofas, sofa beds. They never look like that. So my father is in the American Furniture Hall of Fame because he designed the first sofa that was easy to open and look, and he couldn't tell it opened up. So that's where I come in. All right, we were living in a two-family house in the Bronx which wasn't, it's not exactly the Upper East Side, let me just tell you that. And try to image only three television stations. Can you possibly imagine? Then try to image that you only had TV from like six in the morning to midnight, that was fuzz. So one Sunday afternoon in this two family house in the Bronx, my father and mother came into the living room. We had a TV, not everybody did in those days, black and white. Big magnifying glass. That's how you got a big screen in those days. Put a magnifying glass over it. So um, my father said to my mother, she's laying on the cash for convertible. Did you open it? And my mother said, no, I thought you opened it. And I went, oh my God, she opened it. So they said, honey, do that again. And I couldn't close it. But I could open it. And I opened it and opened it. Now, I don't remember this. This is what I was told. And my father said, this is it. This is how we can get our message out. The newspapers wouldn't work, and this is the marketing part, because a lot of you students, you know, marketing is gonna be so important in whatever you do as you tackle perhaps your own business. But even when working for someone else, marketing, advertising, a lot different today, but critical. So he said television would be the only answer. Radio is talking, newspapers, it could be drawn, no one would believe it. It had to be on TV. So my father called up a, a television station in New York City and said, I want to make a buy. I want to put my daughter on TV to open Castro and Robo. 
They had never had a request for a local TV spot. And my father couldn't afford to advertise in California. He had one little shop in New York City. So they finally figured out a way that he could penetrate what's called the tri-state area. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Big time. He took a six-week package. For five weeks, nothing happened. He was about to cancel. In week six, women started walking in, saying, where's the sofa the little girl opened on TV? And that's all he had to hear. He not only called that station, he called the other two stations. He totally saturated the market. And interesting, there was no other commercial with a child in it. So if you know anybody over 60 that spent part of their life in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, I'm really big with those people, okay? <laughs> they are my people, okay? And, and I will send you a $5 Starbucks card if they don't know and light up when you say, do you remember that commercial with a little girl pulling over the sofa? If they say, we don't know what you're talking about, Dr. Henningsen will get me your name and address and send you a $5 Starbucks card. <laughs> so, it was a big deal, and that's what you know, Dr. Henningsen was talking about. Okay, it was the most televised commercial, I was the most televised child. It was actually a, a sort of a stunt, a fun thing for all the talk shows. Mad Magazine, when I was in middle school, gave me triceps, biceps, and eight page spread. The little girl was kind of like, where's the beef? I'm trying to think of a commercial today. The problem is you have a thousand television stations, literally. And so having one commercial, uh, that is so, what's the right word, embedded. So it was, it, it was great. What was my mom doing? Okay, my mom was waiting tables, bringing my dad the tips when his business started. Then she was his primary cushion stuffer, secretary, and his private chef. As the business took off, she became no secretary. He hired one. He had a factory, but she always remained his private chef. And she has an interesting backstory too. She was born outside McKeesport, Pennsylvania, couldn't speak English because she was six, only spoke Hungarian. She's Hungarian, she was Hungarian-Austrian. Um, very poor dairy farm, eight kids in a room, outhouse. She was chosen to become a nun and go into a convent. Didn't work for her. <laughs> yeah, obviously, didn't work for her. Uh, and she uh, said to her mother, let me come home. There were 10 children in the family, and I'll do more good from outside those walls than from within. And, and she kept that promise. Um, her role, as my dad was building his business, was to give back to the community. So my father, let's talk about his dream a minute. So when he landed at Ellis Island, he wasn't thinking of Ocala, Florida. Okay, he was thinking of New York City. Um, and indeed, that was the metropolitan area made him. But when he discovered Ocala, he fell in love big time. He had never returned to Italy once after he left. He was proud of his Italian heritage, talked about Galileo, Michelangelo, Marconi, but he never taught me Italian. He wanted me to learn English and perfect communicating in English. He thought that was extremely important. And in fact, in the 60s, Senator Hayakawa from California had a movement called English as the official language, a constitutional amendment. It was never passed. But my dad firmly believed that in this country it was extremely important to be fluent in English. Um, he died at 87 here in Ocala. He never missed a vote. He wasn't a strict party man. He was a candidate person. He supported people on both sides of the aisle. He was a true American patriot very supportive of the Florida National Guard. In fact, we had a drop zone on our land, and the National Guard named it the Castro Drop Zone because he gave a big party for all of the guys and their helicopter maneuvers right before um, Desert Storm. And uh, so he, he was a very interesting man with a great sense of business ethics. And, and I, when you all are studying hard, I mean, Business ethics, I'm sure, is part of one of the classes you're taking, because it's really important. My father never cheated a customer, a supplier, or employee. He respected everyone. And 
The other thing that I learned from him, which I admired greatly, was he didn't really care if you made a lot of money as long as you were good at what you did. He didn't equate money with success. And his friends proved that. His best friend was a concert violinist. Rocky Marciano, great heavyweight champion, not a gazillionaire. A four-star retired general in Fort Lauderdale. His friends, professors. He really just wanted you to be determined to be good at what you choose. And he also knew that you might change what your dream is. So now, I want to bring this very close to home. And did Mr. Ewers have to leave the building? Okay, he was seated in the front, but you are in the Ewers Center Center. And Ron Ewers was sitting in the front row, and I was going to introduce him to you, and I hope he's okay. Um, he's got quite a story. So let me just summarize that, because every time you walk in here and you see Ewers Center, Think of Ron Ewers, graduated from high school, no money, couldn't afford college education, decided he would join the Air Force. He realized he had a gift for machine engineering, technical end. So he used that. He saw 40 different countries as a crew member of C-130s because the engineers had to fly with the plane at that time. Married his wonderful wife, Phyllis. Ended up moving to Ocala after being very successful out of state. Moved to Ocala to really grow Emergency One, E1. I'm sure you've all heard of E1. It grew to be the largest fire engine company globally. And they sold that, he did other companies, and he's still working. He's, he's an amazing guy. But he's been very, very supportive of this institution. So he's a wonderful role model and someone I admire a great deal. So why is my story so different from Bernard Castro and Ron Ewers? I had a real head start. Okay, I didn't start with nothing. I didn't have to take out a student loan. I didn't have to support a family. So I was able to change that dream. I was able to sort of move around. Pop star, I mean, I wanted to be a pop star since the time I was a little girl. And so I was getting pretty good. And Barry Gordy, does that anybody know who Barry Gordy is in this room? Okay, when he was in Detroit, um, just to give you an example, he discovered the Supremes, the Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, Michael Jackson, Jackson Five, Temptations, Stevie Wonder, Gladys Knight, Smokey Robinson, bingo, big, huge. I was a huge fan of the crossover sound that, that he was producing. And, um, and I auditioned with him one-on-one -on -one in his big sound studio, and it was about to happen. I had dropped out of the University of Florida, not proud to be a dropout, but I did, to pursue this full-time music career. And I was in Detroit with my father and my manager, and I realized, you know what? You better be careful what you ask for. You don't mess with Barry Gordy. You sign onto his label, He's going to invest money in you. You need to perform. You need to do well. And then I thought of my other dream. I wanted a family. And I couldn't find one pop star. Not one. That could really, really be a star. And have a normal life. So out of respect for Barry Gordon, I graciously thanked him. And I never sang another song, not even in the shower. Went cold turkey. Went back to the University of Florida, got my degree in broadcast journalism. But to this day, the greatest thrill of that climb, on that dream, was meeting Barry Gordy. So we had dream number two, the family. Dream number three, become an executive. And by the way, I have three of my four kids. I want to introduce you to them. They don't want to stand, but they have to. All right? They're, you know, they run businesses. They're, they all have their own careers. I don't care. So my daughter, Terry Keough, stand up. Come on, Terry. My son, John Austin, stand up. And my son, David Austin. There you go. And that really is the best part of life. I know some of you are very young, can't even think of it right now. But it's, it's the best. But then I decided, OK, another dream. Let's go back to Castro Convertibles. I had a family. I was able to, you know, family business. Let's become an executive. Let's take the marketing, advertising, and all that. Let's, let's go with it. 
And I did. And we did well. After my father passed away, though, I decided to sell the brand Castro Convertibles, keep the real estate, and if you as business people, whether you work for an entrepreneur or whether you become one, if you ever have an opportunity to buy a little building or to buy a piece of land that you can operate out of, you do that. As long as you can pay the mortgage and the insurance, you know, and the taxes, that's yours. So I kept the real estate that my father had accumulated because he was very savvy and he bought properties. Um, and then I went to the dream, again, different, public service. I had supported candidates all along, did fundraisers for candidates, but always had an interest in running. So, I went big. I was 50 years old. You can't start at the school board. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and so, I had to go big, so I ran for the United States Senate. <clears throat> it gets an icon, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who no one said could be beaten. So I took 42% of the vote, didn't win. George Pataki won. And he said to me, why don't you come into my cabin and join the team? And I did, and I loved it. And that's some of the photos you saw there. Um, <clears throat> but 12 years in office, that dream sort of came to a close. I didn't want to run. They wanted me to run again. I said, no. High level appointed positions are great. They run this hard. <coughs> I don't know how people run for office today. It's really hard. I love being a spectator. I support them with money. It's a tough business. Really tough. And I'm glad this isn't a political science group. I'm glad it's a business group. <coughs> So we sold the brand, I'm out of politics. What am I gonna do? Too young to retire, didn't want to retire. If people only remember the little girl, let's bring, let's buy that brand back. And let's launch a little product on the internet. A product that could be ups No more showrooms, no more bricks and mortar. And it worked. But, <laughs> I sold the brand a second time. I still do QVC and I help the new owner. <coughs> but now I pester my kids in the commercial real estate business. They've made me chairman, I think, to make me feel good. But what I want to say to you now really has nothing to do with spreadsheets. <coughs> spreadsheets, profit and loss, it's about the soulful part of what we did. How many students in here have an iPhone? <coughs> or an Apple product? Any Apple product, raise your hand. Steve Jobs. <coughs> There's an essay that <coughs> one of my children sent me. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing that Steve Jobs wrote, he was dying. He was a billionaire, 56 years old. <coughs> Kathy, come over here and read this room. There's a few sentences. Let me get my water while Kathy reads this. Because it's three sentences and you should hear it. And I hope that after she reads it, you'll get Steve Jobs. As as we grow older, and hopefully wiser, we realize that a $300 or a $30 watch tell the same time. Whether you fly first class or econ economy, if the plane goes down, you go down with it. Therefore, I hope you realize when you have buddies, friends, brothers and sisters, who you chat with, laugh with, talk with, have, have seen songs with, talk about north, south, east, west, or heaven and earth. That is true happiness. Don't educate your children to be rich. Educate them to be happy. I mean, that's good. That's the first time she read that. Give her a hand. <laughs> so the title of the essay is Six Doctors 
You know who his six doctors were? Steve Jobs, billionaire. Sunlight, rest, exercise, diet, self-confidence, and friends. Several months ago, I listened to his speech by another wise man, Johnny Taylor Jr. Not a household name, bet you never heard of him. He was a speaker at the University of Miami, self-made African-American labor lawyer, human resources expert, brilliant speaker, brilliant businessman, grew blockbuster entertainment into a global giant, went to Viacom, many other businesses in between. And I was blessed to hear him, one of my granddaughters graduated uh, this past December, but he, I'm paraphrasing him, he said very simply, find out what you're good at. Be passionate about it and try to make money doing it. He serves on the boards of many institutions. He had a rough start. He told us how his grandmother would drive him to school passing prostitutes, drug dealers. Johnny Taylor lived by, if you don't remember anything else I've told you today, Lou Holtz, great football coach of the past. Johnny Taylor lived by one of Lou Holtz's quotes. Life is only 10% what happens to you and 90% how you deal with it. You can't control what happens to you all the time. You can't, but you can control how you deal with it. And that's true success. Lou Holtz also said something interesting. Making a big life change is pretty scary. But know what's even scarier? Regrets. So dreams and my children, and one of the reasons, you know, I wanted them to be with me tonight because we're talking about dreams and changing dreams, and is it okay to change? It's absolutely okay. And I'm not talking when you're 15, I'm talking when you're 50. A lot of reasons why you could change your dreams. Let me just go. like to think of it as a detour on the highway. Maybe someone's that you love dearly is sick. Maybe your current boss just doesn't appreciate you and you're dumb. You don't want to go to work in the morning anymore. You're just dumb. And you need a change. Your internal GPS will recalculate. And you will be able to find something that really excites you. And sometimes when you give up a dream because of someone you love or a family situation, it leads to new options that you never even dreamed of. Getting back to the road, we often don't end up where we thought we'd be. We often end up where we were meant to be. So I'm going to leave you with something. I, I am a woman of faith. I, I certainly believe in God, and I hope all of you believe in some sort of higher authority, whatever that means to you. And there's a powerful message from a man that nobody ever heard of either. I have to keep looking at it because I forget his name, poor guy. Okay, Kent Keith. And the only reason I know his name is the poem that he wrote was found on the wall of Mother Teresa of Calcutta a little nun that was amazing. And listen to the poem that she hung on her wall, and I think it's something that we all can appreciate. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world your best anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Thank you all so much.
Give her another round of applause. We have time for some questions. I know students always have questions. Any questions out there? Raise your hand. Anyone? Anyone? In the back? Yep. Why did your father love Ocala? Why did your father love Ocala? So my father fell in love with Ocala. He, he landed in South Florida first after leaving New York. Now, is Mr. Ewers back? Hang on. Ron Ewers, Ewers Center. Ron, thank you for being here. Let's give him. I'm so glad you're fine and back. Good. Um, so my father, remember I said he'd never returned to Italy when he was since he was 15. He was brought to Ocala by Hugh Fontaine, one of his good friends who trained needles, the first Ocala Kentucky Derby winner. And my father saw these rolling hills. He couldn't believe it. It reminded him of southern Italy. And he started buying land. And I want to tell you a cute story about my dad, because he was not a cattle person, okay? He was a you know New York City guy, right? So he bought land and, and some of his friends said, Bernard, you know, you've got to get some cattle. So my father said, okay, that's a good idea, because he ended up accumulating almost five thousand acres. He loved Ocala. And not only did he love the land, but then he opened factory and he opened showroom. And we still, you know where the Horse and Hounds restaurant is? Okay, our family owns that shopping center. That was all furniture at one point. And then the downtown building across from the new hotel. My father bought that. He loved downtown too. Loved all of Ocala. But anyway, let me tell you the funny story. Okay, so he decides he's going to buy some cows. And he looked at the best looking ones and he found them and he bought five of them. And his friend came over and he said, Bernie, you bought five bulls. <laughs> and my father said, but they're so gorgeous. Look at these animals. So Bernie, 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 you don't buy five bulls. So they teased him and called him the big bull buyer. And uh, he did add some cows. But he fell in love with the landscape, the people, the community. You know, my mother started the Royal Dames for Cancer Research. She supported hospice. They had a school, Golden Hills Academy. They started Golden Hills Club, um, Heart Fund, Debutante Ball. They got into the community and into the heart and soul of Marion County. They loved it. Really loved it. Great question. Another question. Standing, standing over here, front row. Do you have any regrets? Do I have any regrets? Wow. That's a really tough question. I mean, this is going to sound really kind of silly, but I wish I had gone to law school. Yeah, I mean, it's it just didn't happen for me, and I have four little children. But if I had a regret, that's probably the only thing. I I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing that I would have loved. There's still time. No, 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 no. There's no time. Trust me, there's no time. No, no, no. Um, but I really have no regrets. I tried a bunch of things, and not because I was fickle. I really loved public service. I really took it seriously. And George Pataki was a very green Republican. We protected a million acres of New York parkland in one way or another. And not just by buying it, but by you know having agreements with lumber companies, timber companies. And so I loved it. I loved all those things I did. So you know, the children have been, and my grandchildren are now my joy. So I'm, I'm, wanna, I'm looking forward to spending more time with them. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Yes. You've been a wonderful, wonderful audience.